We're going to be thinking this evening about this question. Um, how can we be sure about Jesus? Um, apologies if some of the slides, uh, the writing's a bit small. I didn't test it out before I came and I realised when we put the slides up that we should, I should have done that. Um, so I want to cover basically four things. Um, first of all, just to remind us that Jesus of Nazareth is a historical figure. I think some people these days think of him a little bit like Father Christmas, that there's some kind of basis in fact, um, but basically it's a myth. Um, that's, it's, that's not the case with Jesus, so we'll have a quick look at that. Uh, we'll remind ourselves about the historical credibility of the Gospels. We can believe what's written in the Gospels. Um, Tony did a lot of that last week, um, so I don't want to spend ages on that, but it's good just to remind ourselves. Um, then, really, I want to focus on the resurrection. There are four historical facts around, well, there's more than that, but there's four historical facts around the resurrection that I really want to focus on that we have to be able to explain um, and in my view, the only good explanation is that Jesus really did rise from the dead. There's that um, quote from Sherlock Holmes, isn't there? Eliminate everything that's impossible, and whatever you're left with, however improbable, that must be what happened. Um, and so that's really what I want to major on this evening. And then just to talk a little bit about Jesus' purpose, what he was all about, why that makes a difference for us today, um, and the big difference that it makes so let's start then with Jesus of Nazareth and historical figure. Um, so you, you don't need to go to the Bible to find historical documents that talk about Jesus. You can go to other places. So there's a Roman writer called Tacitus who wrote something called the Annals of Imperial Rome. And he speaks about Jesus when he speaks about Christians. Um, so speaking of Christians there, Christians originator Christ had been executed in Tiberius' reign by the governor of Judea, Pontius Pilate. So there we find um, a, someone who doesn't like Christians particularly, um, writing about um, Christians and about Christ in particular, and corroborating what we find written in the Gospels, that Jesus was killed, um, executed um, by Pontius Pilate. Uh, the Jewish Talmud is a collection of writings from Jewish rabbis from about AD 50 to about AD 200. Um, and so they use the Hebrew name for, for Jesus there, Yeshua. Um, on the eve of the Passover, they hanged Yeshua. Uh, so that, again, that fits with what we've got in the Gospels. Um, it was on the eve of the Passover that Jesus was killed. Um, and the word they use there, hanged, um, is often used of crucifixion. Um, hanged on a cross, um, hanged round the neck, there's various ways you can be hanged. So that word hanged refers to crucifixion and you can see that it's the same word is used of Jesus' crucifixion in the New Testament as well. Um, Josephus in the Antiquities of the Jews uh, refers to Jesus as a doer of marvellous deeds. Um, so the understanding that Jesus was someone who did some special stuff um, that's there from outside the Bible as well, at least by reputation. Um, and then Pliny the Younger, in correspondence with the Emperor Trajan, this was just after AD 100. Um, again, he wasn't keen on Christians. He writes this. Um, he explains that he sought to force Christians to curse Christ, which a genuine Christian cannot be induced to do. He, he wrote more than that, but that's enough, I think. Um, so... What he's saying is that there are people who would attach themselves to the church. When you put pressure on them, they'll walk away. They'll, they'll curse Christ and walk away. But the genuine Christian will not. Whatever's going on, you cannot induce a genuine Christian, he said, um, to deny Christ, to curse Christ. They would prefer to be thrown to the lions. Um, and so although it's mainly about Christians, obviously that refers to Christ within um, living memory of his being around. So again, it adds to the evidence that Jesus of Nazareth is a historical figure. He's not someone who's been made up. Um, he's not a fake story. Uh, he's not um, false news or anything like that. <laughs> he's, a, he's a real figure in history. You might remember, if you were here last week, this slide, which I thought was really helpful. Bart Ehrman once would have called himself a Christian, now um, an avowed atheist. But he says this as an atheist. 
The oldest and best sources we have for knowing about the life of Jesus are the four Gospels of the New Testament, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. This is not simply the view of Christian historians who have a high opinion of the New Testament and its historical worth. It's the view of all serious historians of antiquity of every kind, from committed evangelical Christians to hardcore atheists. So the oldest and the best sources we have for knowing about the life of Jesus are the four Gospels. That's the view of all serious historians of antiquity of every kind. Um, and so as we kind of move forward to thinking about the historical credibility of the gospel, here you've got someone who is not a Christian, who is telling, and, and is a historian, <laughs> who's telling us that all serious historians regard the, the gospels of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John as, as really serious, helpful information about this man, Jesus of Nazareth. So he's a historical figure, um, and what we have in the Gospels is historically credible information. Um, let me give you one example. Um, we know when Jesus lived and died. So you can look at the Gospels and you can see they give historical markers. Um, they didn't, in those days, they didn't have BC and AD. <laughs> they marked um, time, they marked years by events. So this is when this person began to reign, or this is when the earthquake was, or those kind of things. So from the Gospels, we know that, born, that Jesus was born during the reign of Herod the Great and during the reign of Caesar Augustus. Um, we know he had a three-year public ministry around about AD 30, which was when, according to the Gospels, Herod Antipas ruled Galilee and Perea. And we know that he was killed by crucifixion under the governorship of Pontius Pilate. Now, what you can then do with archaeology and history is work out their dates. Um, and so, if the Bible's got it right, the dates that we know from history will line up with the historical markers that the Gospels give us. And what we find, what we find is that um, they do. So, if you take, for instance, knowing that Herod the Great um, reigned from 37 to 4 BC, on Augustus from 27 to 14 AD, um, we can work out that Jesus had to have been born um, between 27 and 4 BC. It's slightly embarrassing for the person who worked out the dates um, in the first place, but anyway. Um, <laughs> so Jesus had to have been born before between 27 BC and 4 BC. Um, his public ministry is somewhere around AD 30, um, but it had to be between... 4 BC and 39 AD, because that's when Herod Antipas ruled in Galilee. Um, now, we're edging this direction, aren't we? Because um, Jesus was born somewhere around here. So we're looking at kind of 26 forwards, maybe, 25, 26 forwards. And we know he, he died during the governorship of Pontius Pilate, and that was AD 26 to AD 37. So from this... Um, we can estimate that Jesus was probably born four or five, 5 or 4 BC, um, that his ministry was from maybe around 25, 26 AD up to uh, 28, 29, 30, um, when he was crucified under, under Pontius Pilate. And so just with this example of the historical markers that are put in the Gospels line up exactly... Um, with these dates that we're able to work out from archaeology and from history. Um, it helps us to see that the information that we have in the Gospels is historically credible. And if that information is credible, then that suggests that the other things that are written in the Gospels are also credible. It also suggests, let's look at these two together, um, a, a, an early writing date for the Gospels. Um, again, Tony touched on this last week. Let me give you an example. If I wrote about, say in 50 years' time, I wrote about 1985 and talked about how everyone was using their iPhone, a bit of history would tell you that I didn't know what I was talking about because the iPhone wasn't around until, what, 2003, 2007? I can't remember what it was. I've got two dates in my head. The noughties, anyway. Um, and so you'd be able to tell that my information is not accurate. So you can do that kind of thing with the Gospels. You can look at people, um, like we've got there. You can look at places and place names. 
Um, you can look at customs, you can look at the kind of things that they talked about, and you find that the, the gospel writers are talking about the time period that, again, you can tell through archaeology and history, um, of kind of 0 to 30 AD. Um, so the gospel writers must have been writing fairly early, because if they were late, they wouldn't have those details. That is, of course, what you find with the Gnostic Gospels, things like the Gospel of Thomas, that are written 100, 150, 200 years later. They don't have any of those details. The closest they get even to a place is Jerusalem, and I think that's it. And so because they haven't got those details, you're thinking, well, I'm not sure I can trust those ones. But when you have got those details in, particularly the amount of detail that you've got um, in the Gospels, um, it shows you that the people who are writing the Gospels must have lived in the area because they just wouldn't have known. Um, and they must have lived around that time as well, because otherwise, customs would have changed. You know, I, I, if I had a mobile phone in 1985, it would be about the same size as my Bible is now. And the only reason this is this size is because I can't see so well. Um, <laughs> so the details of the Gospel accounts, both the personality and the places, suggest an early writing. And the number of copies that we've got of these documents um, help us to know that we've got um, what was originally written down. So I don't know if you know, but at the time, it would have been written down, the gospel accounts would have been written down on papyrus. Papyrus doesn't last. Um, it's like um, the new uh, shopping bags that biodegrade. Papyrus biodegrades, and so you're unlikely to have much papyrus left, and that's the reality. We do have some gospel fragments, maybe some from before 100 AD, um, but only, you know, not full gospel accounts on the papyrus. You have to wait till you get paper. Once paper's invented, that lasts a lot longer, and so you start then getting full copies. But obviously, they have to be copies. The reality is, though, that so many copies were made, so many translations were made, um, so many quotes were made of the New Testament, um, that through a process called textual criticism, I won't go into that right now, but comparing the different copies you can work out what the original said with a massive degree of accuracy. The number of words in the New Testament that have any kind of quibble about them still, I think is less than 1%. And at no point are they causing us any kind of trouble um, with, with doctrine, with what we actually believe and what the Bible teaches. So we have this great credibility of the Gospels. And then this, this is my favorite one with the Gospels. So we've got four Gospels. We've got four accounts telling the same story. Each one of those accounts depends on eyewitnesses. Matthew went around with Jesus. John went around with Jesus. Mark went around with Peter, who went around with Jesus. So Mark's got his Gospel from Peter. Um, and Luke, at the beginning of his Gospel, didn't go around with Jesus, but he tells us this. Many have undertaken to draw up an account of the things that have been fulfilled among us just as they were handed down to us by those who from the first were eyewitnesses and servants of the word. With this in mind, since I myself have carefully investigated everything from the beginning, I too decided to write an orderly account for you, most excellent Theophilus, so that you may know the certainty of the things you have been taught. Uh, Luke is meticulous. Um, in terms of historical markers, Luke has the most. Um, a long time ago, everybody thought that Luke was, well, non-Christians anyway, thought that, that Luke was a spurious gospel because he had made up so much. But through um, the 18 and 1900s, they kept making discovery after discovery to find that what Luke wrote was exactly right and that his history is remarkably good. Um, and so the secular historians now would say they think that Luke is, is the most accurate of the gospels course as Christians we believe it's all the word of God and it's all accurate. That doesn't detract from the fact that the Gospels have some significant differences. Um, they're written for instance with different, um, different controlling themes behind them. So Mark is writing to show you that Jesus is the king promised in the Old Testament and the suffering servant in the, promised in the Old Testament and they're the same person. Um, John on the other hand is much more concerned to show us that Christ is divine. 
And so although they're telling the same story, you get similar and the same details, you get different things as well. Um, they are telling from different perspectives. So it's not surprising that you get differences in the details. They're writing to teach. They're not just writing to record. Everything that is written down is written down with a purpose of teaching us um, rather than just giving us information about Jesus. It's not like, they're not like normal biographies that we would read today. But if you think about eyewitness statements, imagine yourself in court and you're in the jury and you're listening to eyewitness statements of an event. Um, what you will find is those eyewitness statements will differ from each other. If they're genuine eyewitness statements, the different witnesses will have noticed different details, even to the point where you think, how can that go with that? Whereas if it's a, if it's a made up story, and the people have got their story together, they'll all tell you exactly the same thing. And it becomes immediately obvious that this is a stitch up. That's not what you get with the Gospels. With the Gospels, there are some things that I think are hard to reconcile in the differences. But over 2,000 years, no one has ever come up with one that can't be reconciled. Lots of people have tried, but they've never managed it. So when we come to reading the Gospel accounts, we can read them with great confidence. These are things that we can be reading and thinking, yes, these are eyewitness accounts. This is what really happened. Um, we need to take these things on board. Okay, the resurrection. There are four facts that I want us just to think about briefly um, connected with the resurrection. The first one is this, that Jesus of Nazareth was crucified to death in the time of Pontius Pilate. That is a historical fact. The second is the tomb where he was buried was emptied by the morning of the third day after his death. That is a historical fact. His followers were convinced they saw him alive again. That is a historical fact. And the church grew at a remarkable speed. That is also a historical fact. We need to be able to explain these four facts other things as well, but let's stick with these. These four facts, adequately, all of them, in a way that means Jesus didn't rise from the dead, for us to be really sure he didn't. It's my contention that we cannot explain these four facts without admitting that the resurrection really happened. Jesus, Jesus said a lot of remarkable things, didn't he? Perhaps the most remarkable thing he said is uh, his prediction of his death. I will be rejected, beaten, killed, and after three days I will rise from the dead. He said it a number of times. All of the gospel writers talk about the fact that Jesus knew he was going to his death. They also talk about the fact that he was sure he would rise from the dead. Now that's a pretty remarkable claim. <laughs> it's remarkable because it doesn't happen. That's the whole point, isn't it? It's a unique event in the history of the world. Um, you can't bring yourself back to life. But Jesus said, actually, I have authority both to lay down my life and to take it back up again. So we need to think about these four facts. First of all, Jesus of Nazareth was crucified to death at the time of Pontius Pilate. We know that. Jesus died. He was killed on a Roman cross. We see that clearly attested to in the Gospels. We also have seen that attested to in non-Christian literature. It's exactly what Tacitus told us and others as well. Um, you can see um, that Jesus was killed on a Roman cross um, just by looking at the history. It's a historical fact. So we know he died. Sometimes people want to say, well, maybe he didn't die. The Romans knew what they were doing with killing people. <laughs> they were very good at it, particularly criminals. Uh, and we find with Jesus, actually, um, they were surprised he was dead already. Um, they wanted to kill the other two off quickly, so they broke their legs. But with Jesus, they just made sure he was dead by sticking a spear in his side, which would have pierced the, um, around the heart, and hence you got the flow of blood and water that the Bible talks about. Again, eyewitness details. So we know that Jesus died. 
He died under Pontius Pilate on a cross. The tomb where he was buried was empty by the morning of the third day. Buried on Friday, Saturday, Sabbath day, can't do anything. Sunday, Sunday morning, the women go to the tomb. Um, They don't go there expecting to find an empty tomb. They go there to anoint Jesus' body to finish the burial preparation. Uh, But when they get there, they are shocked in the extreme to find the tombstone rolled away. This is a big stone, kind of take 10 men to move it, kind of stone. And um, Jesus' body gone. And they're told by two angelic beings, he's not here, he is risen. There's no way they could have got the tomb wrong. The tomb belonged to a man called Joseph of Arimathea. Um, He knew which tomb it was he put Jesus in. If the authorities wanted to snuff out Christianity before it had begun, they would have just got hold of Joseph and said, take us to the tomb. In fact, the authorities themselves knew which tomb it was because they posted a guard outside it to make sure that the disciples couldn't steal the body. Uh, The only opportunity they would have had to steal the body was on the Sabbath day. There's no way they would have broken the Sabbath. And so we could go on and on and on and on. So you've got the fact that if there was a body in a tomb that belonged to Jesus, the easiest way for um, the authorities to stop the disciples and their silly rumours about a resurrection would be to produce the body, but they couldn't. And then you find these disciples who are completely crestfallen. They don't know what to do with themselves. They're scared stiff. They're, lock, they're locking themselves in rooms because they're scared they're going to be crucified next. Completely transformed to being people who will stand in front of the, 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 the Jewish leaders and say, you, you crucified the author of life. <laughs> the difference is incredible. There is no way... They got the tomb wrong. It is certain that the tomb was empty. That is a historical fact. It needs to be explained. His followers were convinced they saw him alive again. Um, So in 1 Corinthians 15, you've got that summary of the different um, appearances of the Lord Jesus. It's not all of them, but it's a good summary. He appears to the women. He appears to Peter. He appears to the 12. He appears to James, his brother. He appears to 500 people at once, um, most of whom are still alive, says Paul. Go and ask them if you don't believe me, was the idea. Um, And last of all, he says, he appeared to me. In some ways, Paul is the best witness because Paul is a hostile witness. That is, he was a Pharisee. He was dead set against Christians. He was going from town to town to arrest and kill Christians when Jesus appeared, the risen Jesus appeared to him and completely transformed his life. So the followers are absolutely convinced that they saw him alive again. Um, And Thomas, perhaps, is the best example for us. So this is in John's Gospel, chapter 20. I like to think that probably I would have been a bit like Thomas. That is not necessarily in a good way. (laughs) So, Jesus has appeared to his disciples, but Thomas wasn't there. This is what it says. Now, Thomas, also known as Didymus, which means the twin, one of the twelve was not with the disciples when Jesus came. So, the other disciples told him, we've seen the Lord. But he said to them, unless I see the nail marks in his hands and put my finger where the nails were and put my hand in his side where the spear went, I will not believe. Now, you're not going to say something like that if you're expecting the guy to turn up. (laughs) He really is not expecting Jesus to turn up. A week later, the disciples were in the house again, and Thomas was with them. Though the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here. See my hands. Reach out your hand and put it into my side. Stop doubting and believe. And Thomas says to him, My Lord and my God... Jesus told him, because you've seen me, you've believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. Jesus performed many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not recorded in this book. 
But these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. Let me ask you a slightly strange question. Do you believe in JFK? That is, do you believe that John F. Kennedy was a real person who really lived, who was really the president of America and was really assassinated? Most likely you do. Did you, did you ever meet him? Have you seen him? No. So what are you relying on to know that uh, JFK was a real person? Those events really happened. Well, you're relying on historical evidence. You know, there's video footage. There's eyewitnesses that we can talk to. Now, obviously, now we can't talk to eyewitnesses then, but John is very clear when he writes these things down. He's saying, I'm writing these things down so that you have a record of the eyewitnesses. I know you won't get to see Jesus, but let me, let me give you a record so that you can know truth about him. Luke, in his introduction, says exactly the same, so that you can know the truth about what happened. Let me give you the eyewitnesses' accounts. So we've got really good historical evidence about Jesus, about who he was, about what he did, and about his resurrection. His, con his followers were convinced they saw him alive, even though that was completely outside of anything that they would believe. And this is the last point, that the church grew at a remarkable speed. The church grew so fast that within 40, 50, 60 years of Jesus' death, the emperor in Rome was very concerned about Christians and was killing them off. That's a long way for it to go. If you think about it, Jesus was born in obscurity to obscure parents. He grew up pretty much in, in, in obscurity. He, he had three years of public ministry and was killed in the most shameful way as a criminal. The point of crucifixion was, you do not want to be associated with this person. For the Jews to see someone who was claiming to be their Messiah killed like that, for them it would have meant he's not our Messiah because the Messiah is going to be powerful and glorious. For the Greeks, how can, you, how can you make this guy your leader? He is killed as a criminal in utter shame. Romans, an ordinary Roman citizen was not allowed to be crucified. It was too shameful. Rome was too glorious. And yet, within 60 years of Jesus' death, less than that actually, in, from Jerusalem to Rome and beyond, people, Jews and Gentiles, Jews and Greeks, Jews and Romans, were worshipping Jesus. The church grew and grew and grew, and it was worshipping him amongst severe persecution. Um, you read what Pliny the Younger wrote, just over 60 years after Jesus' death. He's deliberately out to persecute Christians. It's part of his job as a governor in Rome. And yet, in the midst of that, the church is growing and growing and growing. Why would an organization that invites persecution on itself simply by what it believes grow? Surely it's going to shrink and die, unless there's something about it which is incredible. So these are four historical facts that we have to find a way of explaining if we're going to say Jesus didn't rise from the dead. I've read quite a lot. I've worked hard to try and understand how they can be explained in a different way, and I can't find a different way. I've sought to eliminate everything that's impossible, and I've come up with just what is normally improbable, that the Lord Jesus Christ must have risen from the dead. And if he's risen from the dead, then we need to listen to what he says. Because if when he says, I will take my life back up again, and he does, if that's true, surely we have to listen to everything else that he says. Let me finish just briefly then with the purpose of Jesus. This is what he says in Mark's Gospel, chapter 10, verse 45. Um, Son of Man is, is an Old Testament title that he takes for himself. For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and give his life as a ransom for many. It's Jesus, one of Jesus' great purpose statements. There's a few of them in the Gospels. This is what I'm about, he says to his disciples. 
if he is who the resurrection declares him to be, God taking on human nature, then he is the only person who should be served by everybody in the world throughout history. But he comes and says, but I've not come to be served, I've come to serve you. I've come to give my life, to die, so he knows about it, as a ransom, as a payment to set you free for many. What is that freedom that we need? Well, again, earlier in Mark's Gospel, Jesus says, I've not come for the righteous, I've come for sinners. I've come for people who know before God they've got a problem. People who are, have the humility to sit down and say, I've not done the things that are right. I've not been the person that I ought to be. It's all very well looking at other people and pointing out their faults, but actually I need to point the finger at me. And Jesus says, I've come for you, that I might save you, rescue you for your, from your sin. In Romans, this is a slightly complicated one, but it's helpful. The last line is very helpful. So in the letter to the church in Rome that we call the book of Romans, um, the Apostle Paul is writing about a man called Abraham from the Old Testament, and it's uh, talking about a time when he put his faith in God, and God credited that faith to him as righteousness. It's not that he was good, but because he believed and he put his trust in God and God's promises, God said, I'm going to count you then as righteous. And Paul says that wasn't just written down for him, that was also written down for us. Because we are also those whom God is going to give righteousness to. It's for us who believe in him, who raised Jesus our Lord from the dead. He was delivered over to death for our sins and was raised to life for our justification. So Jesus' purpose is that by putting our faith in him, we're counted to be united with him in his death and resurrection. So our sins, which deserve God's judgment, rather than our being judged for them, Christ is judged for them on the cross. And they're killed. When he dies, our sin is killed. And in his resurrection, he gives us new life, which will go on into eternity. Um, that's what justification is all about. Declared to be right. You've been justified. Um, not because of anything that we've done, but because we've trusted God's promise to do it for us. And that's Jesus' whole purpose in his death and resurrection. How can we be sure about Jesus? There's lots more that could be said. <laughs> and I've gone on far too long anyway. Um, but I really want you to think about those, the, the historical facts around the resurrection. I think they're really, really strong. Um, spend um, five minutes or so perhaps talking in your groups. I wrote down a couple of questions because I knew I wouldn't remember them. Um, so just think about what you found most interesting from tonight's presentation. Hopefully it's not my glasses, they're not particularly interesting. Um, and can you think of a way to explain away the resurrection? Can you think of a way that explains those four facts without Jesus having risen from the dead? Um, after five minutes or so, do feel free to get more tea and cakes, etc. Um, we'll come back and we'll do some Q&A. All right, thank you.